and I'm not. I'm Ross. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're still happy to be here. We're still happy now on the record to be here. Um, we uh, um, This is a, a presentation that I think has um, been really part of um, our professional collaboration and our personal friendship uh, for the last eight plus years. And so we're very excited to have an opportunity to talk a little bit with you all about ways we can um, enhance the really great sexual violence prevention work that's going on with sexual health education and sex positivity. Excellent. So, who are you? I'm Kim Rice, and as mentioned, we're, I work in uh, sexual health education. I've done so for the last 13 years, primarily with college students, and have really enjoyed the uh, learning and growth that I've done personally and professionally in collaborating with Ross around uh, sexuality issues and sexual violence prevention. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful collaboration and, and really pleased to be able to share that work and the successes and some of the challenges of that work with all of you. So thank you for being here. And, um, and as mentioned, my work's primarily been with a college-age population at the University of Illinois at um, Urbana-Champaign. And um, so we've had a lot of opportunities to cross-collaborate um, and to, to look at ways that um, sexual violence prevention can be enhanced by sexual health and sexuality education and vice versa. So, so, yeah, what we hope to talk about today or address today is how to incorporate a sex-positive approach to sexual violence prevention and to talk a little bit about what we mean by sex positivity. It's kind of a buzz, buzz phrase or catchphrase right now. Uh, to look at some of the skills for balancing discussions that include both healthy talks about healthy sex and unhealthy sexual violence, including how to um, guide audiences or move audiences through some of those discussions. And then we'll provide information on a model program outline that we've used with college students to have these discussions. Yep. So we want to take a moment to um, get a sense, we're playing with the functions on this presentation, to find out uh, who, who you all are, um, what audiences you work with when you're doing uh, presentations or service provision, and, and a couple other questions about what specific trainings you all might have. So, um, uh, Yahweh, can you help us with the first question? So, what type of agency do you work within? Um, rape Crisis Center, uh, K through 12 school, college or university, community mental health or public health, criminal justice or other? Just take a little bit of time to let everybody respond. Lots of rape crisis centers. As we might expect. Lots of other. Lots of other. It's very possible our multiple choice did not include everyone. If um, if you're in another sort of organization, can you go ahead and chat what sorts of organizations um, were not encompassed by this? Domestic violence organizations. State sexual assault. Child advocacy centers. Planned Parenthood. LGBT organizations. Great. So, so we have, so we have a lot of other um, community and statewide agencies. Uh, several Planned Parenthoods I saw. Um, several um, domestic violence and um, and interpersonal violence uh, work. So, great. Um, well, welcome. I'm glad that you all are here. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so who are audiences, or if you don't have an audience, if you're not an educator, um, who might you um, work primarily with? Again, it's very possible that these do not encompass everyone. Give everyone a chance to respond. I'm loving this chat function. This is great. So it's kind of like you all are whispering in my ear. It's very distracting. Keep whispering. So um, can we go ahead and skip to the results 
for now. Can we do that, Yahweh? Say that again. Okay. There we go. Never mind. Um, Pretty evenly divided. Mm-hmm. So, um, looks like a lot of folks work with um, high school age. Um, about 40% work with K through 8. Um, 45% or so work with college age students. Um, we've got faith based organizations, professionals, other. Yeah, some of the other responses included um, training for teachers. So when we talked about schools, I think people are assuming that's the children. So we have some folks that do teacher training and folks who work with families primarily um, or the community at large. And part of why part of why we wanted to get a sense for this is because um, definitely the ways that um, we talk about sex and sexuality and sexual violence and rape are um, different in the spaces that we're in in terms of um, mostly in terms of what the powers that be allow us to talk about. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but but um, definitely there are places that you all can imagine where you have more freedom to talk about um, the, the topics at hand and the approach you want to, and then there are others that um, may be more constrained. And so thinking about what might, um, how might you adjust to those. Okay, so um, just two more questions. Um, yes or no, do you have specific training in rape prevention education? So it looks like about 60% of folks do have training and about 40% don't um, or, or have not had formal training in rape prevention education, um, which is good to know. And one of the things that, um, that I often think a lot about is the ways that doing this kind of education in, um, about sexual violence is often um, things that we've picked up as we've gone along rather than um, any formalized education about how to how to do this work. Um, so that's that's really I think important and useful to know. Um, so we'll jump to the next question. Um, how many of you do have specific training in providing sexual health education? So sexual health education broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So looks kind of like the flip. Yes. Yeah. Flip to flip flop. And um, somebody asked if you've received training or provided training. We're asking if you've received training, you've been trained. Okay. So um, part of why this is, I think, really interesting and important to think about is that, um, as we'll talk about, that our work has been co-influenced by the areas of expertise that we each bring into the room, and at the same time, there's been education that I've had to do for myself, coming primarily out of the rape crisis movement, on sexual health and sexuality um, that that has been necessary in order for me to expand my ways of talking about um, sexual violence prevention um, and incorporating sex positivity into that. So, um, so I think that that it's. It's important and good for us to look at where we've received formalized training and, and um, where we haven't had an opportunity to. So um, one of the activities that um, I often have students in my classes do, um, and I, I used to teach several classes for peer educators in particular, though I think this is a really interesting um, concept for any group to struggle with is what would it look like if we lived in a world without rape? So having folks uh, draw, talk through, just imagine what that world would look like, and not as a um, as an activity that's um, ultimately to disappoint them, but as an activity to really say what is it we want, what is our vision for this world, and then to step back and say how might we get there, um, and. Um, this has been really influenced by um, by several different writers. Andy Peck um, from Men Stopping Violence in uh, Georgia has an amazing piece about um, 
what what would it mean if we as rape crisis centers had a folder that said how to end rape and we and we had some plans in there and really worked towards that end for prevention so for me personally that's where prevention has to to be is to say how do we end rape um, as opposed to just ameliorating that um, so um, as the the term sexual violence prevention has really gained a lot of um, it has become really popular in the last five ten years. I think this is something that the ways that public health language has entered into the rape crisis movement. I think we've seen a lot more of this. And so when we're talking about sexual violence prevention, um, we mean stopping the perpetrator from perpetrating. So um, that does not mean. Uh, simply risk reduction, which um, we're going to separate out as being very different, that um, if you're simply moving around the potential targets of that violence, that's not prevention. Prevention is actually intervening, keeping the perpetrator from perpetrating. Um, as I'm not telling you all anything you don't know, this is a social issue, so it requires social change. And so we're talking not just about um, helping individual people make individual choices differently, um, and helping, but also helping their communities um, encourage and discourage the choices that helps promote a safe, healthy environment. Um, and I think as a movement, as, as um, a lot of what I've been a part of and part of the rape crisis movement, um, sometimes we focus a lot on the absence of rape. Uh, we don't as much talk about what we need in the place of that. And so um, prevention for us is, has to be something new added to the mix, not just eliminating something. Something has to fill, um, fill that gap there. And so what is, it, what is it we think about when we're imagining this world without rape that's new and how these new relationships are going to look? So part of the work that Ross and I had done together, um, we started to examine, okay, so what is it then that we think healthy sexuality should look like? Or if we're talking about the presence of something new, what is that new thing? What would that look like for our world and for our communities and for um, the people that we're involved with specifically, partners, family, friends, et cetera? So one of the activities that we do with college students is to ask them um, in the beginning of the presentation after ground rules are set and we introduce ourselves, to ask them to break into groups and to make a list, um, so just brainstorm ideas about what is good sex, to just simply answer that question. So we're going to ask all of you to, again, use your chat function and just type in your ideas about what is good sex. Yeah, one word, two words. We have consent, communication, fun, mutual, joy, consent, consent, consent. Thrill. Hot, fun, open, enthusiastic, monogamous, fulfilling, orgasm, woo, <laughs> sizzling, wild, safe, yay, uncoursed, no pressure, the big O, loving, trusting, connection, steamy, low risk of pregnancy or STDs. endorphins, feel safe, ability to talk openly and discuss, and frequent. Awesome. So when we um, ask college students to develop this list, or other audiences too, often it, it's really hard for them to even understand what it is that we're asking them. I mean, it seems like a pretty easy question from our perspective, just brainstorm as you all did really quickly, what is good sex? But we often get a lot of questions about what we mean by that, if we're looking for um, defining sexual behaviors or what they think good sex should be. But it's surprising to us that, one, students have never been, or young people have never been asked this question before and certainly have never been asked to brainstorm it openly with adults or educators, authority type figures in the room. And one thing I'll add about um, seeing your list versus the list that we've seen, um, consent will often make an appearance on the list eventually. Um, the other thing that will make an appearance on the list, usually the last thing they say is love. That's usually like the 185th thing that they put up there on the list. Um, but the, um, there's often not the focus on um, the safety, that, that um, those things are not 
don't as often incorporate themselves into the list that the college students make. Yeah, they might say protection, but again, it's a lot of their responses are, are vague. Um, and here are some of the responses that they will give, which in, whoop, I'm going to back up. Sorry about that. Mutual pleasure, communication, everybody orgasm, passionate protection, and last on the list usually is love. And certainly they, um, they put a lot more than just six responses on their list. Other things that they put on their list, though, include things like Eiffel Tower, um, 69, whipped cream, handcuffs, whips, chains, strawberries, um, and, and lots and lots of sex or frequent sex. And so um, it's interesting when we talk to them, one, when we ask them to define like things like Eiffel Tower or other behaviors mm -hmm. that Ross and I may or may not know the definitions or what they mean by that, but how uncomfortable they can become when we ask them to actually define what those behaviors are. So there's a lot of sort of sayings that we use to talk about sex, but when we, when we try to talk about it more openly or honestly, it becomes really difficult or uncomfortable. Um, it's also interesting when we ask about sort of what the expectations, like the second list, the Eiffel Tower, lots of sex, whipped cream, seems to be more about what the expectation or what they've been told or shown that good sex is versus what they think it actually is um, or what it might actually include when we talk about what good sex really looks like in real life. Um, Students also add when we ask them that this is not the kind of sex that college students are having in terms of everything that they've put on their list and more specifically that good sex isn't the kind of sex that college students are having once they review the list that they've made. Yeah. Kim, we've gotten quite a few questions about what Eiffel Tower is. Yeah. So Eiffel Tower, and Ross can help define this if I get it wrong, is when um, a woman is bent over in between two men, and so usually she's performing oral sex on one man while being penetrated either vaginally, anally, or both by the other man. And they're high-fiving above her. So, um, and, and the interesting thing about um, some of those comments, those types of things is that they were the ones that students were um, quick enough, were, were very quick to, um, to dispel as being not the kind of sex that, that, um, that they or their friends are having, um, that they're really just trying to be funny at that point in time. And uh, asking them to define it, asking them to talk about it is really kind of fun because it makes them really awkward and uncomfortable. Yeah, but it also opens up a dialogue that then when we say, like, okay, what is that? Tell us about that. Teach us about what yeah. that behavior is and what's pleasurable about that um, or what's, you know, exciting about that position. And when the conversation sort of shuts down because of embarrassment or they don't want to say to either older adults or if we're, if we're um, presenting to all men, sometimes I think there's a gender dynamic because I'm a female. Mm -hmm. um, that they don't want to say that in yeah. front of me. Um, but then it allows us to open up a discussion about how difficult it is to actually talk openly about sexuality, including things like sexual pleasure, um, orgasm, all of the things on their list without using these like funny terms or, um, you know, vague descriptions for things. Um, so just some things that we've noticed in our discussions is that, you know, sex is really complex. It's really difficult for people to talk about it openly and honestly. Um, like I had mentioned, nobody has really asked them to think about these things before, so it's really striking to us that um, in, in thinking about the absence of something, there's a real absence in our culture about encouraging people to take an active role in defining what good sex should look like, what healthy sexuality really is, and being very specific and deliberate about that right down to examining what that would look like in each and every sexual encounter that they will have. Um, and there's a lot of rewards and challenges both for presenters of this information and to audience members about really thinking more deeply and more critically about this because mm -hmm. um, it does require a lot of, a lot of thought and um, it can be sort of uncomfortable for folks. Well, I think it requires them to talk about what they want themselves, to know that, and to be able to define that on their own terms. Um, right, it and it becomes incredibly personal when they have to think about, within a group of people, what they 
want sex to look like mm -hmm. for them and not that we necessarily ask them to share that but just to be able to think about that when they've never thought about it before it's really easy to dismiss it with things like 69 whipped cream eiffel tower um, but when we actually have to reflect on that it can be hard um, and so sort of the bottom line i think is that it's hard for people to imagine what a world um, that included healthy sexuality or was really sex positive would look like because we fail to give young people this information and our culture doesn't support that approach. So some of the barriers to healthy or supportive sexuality um, or sexuality education is that often we only talk about the negative consequences of sexual behaviors. We rarely bring in considerations about pleasure, um, you know, taking an active role, like we mentioned, with their sexuality, including specific sexual behaviors, and giving permission for people, especially young people, to be sexual and to celebrate their sexuality, whether or not that includes engaging in specific sexual behaviors. We've noticed that in all male spaces, it can um, be difficult for the men to be serious. At the same time, though, we have experienced where men are very thankful and that's some of the, the most positive, I think, um, feedback that we've received, that they really okay. appreciated having a space where they could talk more seriously and were sort of forced because of our uh, Ross and Mind approach um, in setting the tone in terms of presenters to be able to have serious discussions with other men about sexuality that included a positive approach to sexuality while also addressing sexual violence prevention so that positive sexuality really means um, you know, mutual pleasure and to really be able to deconstruct what that means and how we can get there. Uh, certainly we live in a, in a culture where sex is everywhere, everybody should, should and is doing it all of the time. Um, everything, you know, we're sold sex with every product, but we restrict sex education in schools. Um, people receive very little accurate information about sexuality, including their bodies and how their bodies work. And then, of course, the double bind that's faced by women, that they should know a lot about reproduction and sexual health um, and also be sort of the gatekeepers of sexuality and safeguard that, both their sexuality and their sexual health, and to be really, really sexual, uh, but to also make sure that they're always saying no and um, that certainly they can be sexual, but not in terms of stating, understanding and stating their own sexual needs and desires and to, and to really be the expert in that for themselves. Sex is still taboo within our culture, um, you know, and as... Uh, Saul Gordon, uh, a, a sex educator, used to say uh, when he was alive that sex is dirty, a, a dirty, horrible thing that we should really say for someone that we love. So there's incredible mixed messages around sexuality that makes it difficult to uh, really reinforce the idea of a sex-positive culture. And, uh, you know, as, as I'm looking at our barriers, I think that this, the, this, what we experience in all male spaces is the flip side to this double bind faced by women, that, um, that women aren't supposed to know too much about sex, and men are supposed to know everything about sex. And so um, someone asked the question if we see a difference in gender spaces, and I think that there have been some, that there's been a very different environment the more men that have been in there. We did one for a mostly female room that I feel like the group was really open and honest with each other, um, and we didn't have any of those, uh, the responses that people were just saying to get a rise out of everyone during the good sex um, uh, brainstorming. And then we had uh, one that we've done with a fraternity, with we've done a couple in fraternities, but one in particular that I remember where it really spun um, out of not out of control, but it spun around and we had to reel them back in. But I think the interesting thing in both of those is that their responses to how they've been taught they're supposed to um, know what they're supposed to know or what they're supposed to um, be able to talk about sexuality. And I think um, both men and women are really hungering for a place where they could talk about it. Men, I think it was very difficult for them to talk openly about it um, given the homophobia and uh, masculinity things that were playing in the, on in the room. Yeah. Men definitely are, um, it sort of highlighted how men are expected to know more about sexual behaviors and women are expected to know more about protection, whether that's from pregnancy or STDs. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, um, something that um, that we work on and think a lot about is how do we place these together? How do we place healthy sexuality within the everyday work of sexual violence prevention um, outside of the um, special workshops or collaborations we might do? Um, part of that is about defining what we feel like as, as um, sex educators and and um, rape prevention folks, what does good sex look like in a world without rape? Um, there's a new anthology or newish anthology out um, that hopefully most of you have seen. If you haven't, you should take a look at it, called Yes Means Yes, uh, Visions of Female Sexual Power in a World Without Rape. And uh, Jacqueline Friedman and Jessica Valenti co-edited this anthology, and many folks from um, around the country are, are part of, of the um, the writing in here, and so they they really challenge this idea of no means no being the be all end all. That we also have to talk about what yes means. That that um, when that no means no gets us so far, it really helps us establish some boundaries in some ways as a movement. And then what does yes mean? How do we how do we figure that out? How do we think about that? Um, so and and part of this that that. Uh, I, you know, I kind of present out to you all and think about is how this would change rape crisis work if healthy sexuality was a primary focus. So um, that's that's just something to to kind of challenge yourselves around. Like, what would your everyday work of going out and doing presentations look like if you also had a lens of healthy sexuality in there? So sex positivity, um, it's this term, it's a buzz term um, that um, we use and hopefully don't overuse. Um, definitely, it came out of the uh, sex, sexuality, sexual health um, work that talks about sexuality being a component of our physical and psychological development, um, one of many aspects of who we are. Um, and part of what we mean when we're talking about being sex positive means that uh, we're encouraging and promoting consensual, healthy sexual interactions, um, interactions that are um, respectful and, um, and, and, and healthy for all involved. Um, that part of this means that um, we've got to combat the messages that we've already talked about in terms of what sex is expected to look like, that it should be shameful, bad, violent, um, or that it, it should be um, the, the kind of other messages that everyone should be having it in one particular way. So really challenging any kind of dominant notions of what sex should be so people can be able to define that on their own terms and with their community. And then additionally to that is that everyone should have access to medically accurate sexual health information. Um, we did a survey in Illinois, well, we didn't do it, but somebody did a survey in Illinois in the last couple of years, and part of what they found is that although um, I think only what, 68, 70% of schools taught how to use a condom, yeah. and then um, it really went down from there in terms of what other schools taught. So um, rape education, I think, was 25% of the, of the classes of sexual health classes received any information about sexual violence. Um, what I know from my experience with sexual health education um, is that often what gets taught is the mechanics of reproduction, but very little else. So as Kim mentioned, we don't talk about pleasure or desire. We don't talk about the emotional components or psychological components of sex and sexuality. We don't talk about the ways that this is part of healthy development, um, and we certainly don't normalize. Um, sexuality and, and sexual behavior. Um, so these are all, I think, important components to medically accurate sexual health information, uh, you know, as would be um, contraception and things like that that also don't get taught very often. But m talking about a more comprehensive, instead of just sex ed, like what goes where, also sexuality education, really expanding that. And, and also what it means to, um, what it means to be sex positive, for everyone, so um, promoting 
consensual healthy sexual interactions for um, not just certain groups of people but everybody and I just want to interject here there was a question that came up on the chat about if uh, media literacy needs to play a part in this and absolutely and that's part a big part of what we end up talking about in our workshops so when students will make a list about what what good sex is we'll ask them from where did they learn what good sex is and so yeah. sometimes it might be family but not usually it's usually media porn um, other outlets TV movies friends, friends etc and so we end up um, trying to use current or relevant examples from media both um, popular you know mainstream media and and pornography as well to highlight things that are sex positive and things that are then sex negative and so I think introducing the language of when something is sex negative is um, also helpful it's a little bit easier I think for young people to di digest like mm -hmm. um, other than saying like this is sexual violence or this is violence against women and I'm not saying we shouldn't use those phrases in terms we absolutely need to and to point those out as well but to add an additional you know when when something occurs when we see in a in a popular movie um, somebody making a joke this was in the hangover they called rohypnol um, they called them rapies and so that was the joke in, in one of the jokes in the movie. And so when we can look at that stuff and point that out as being really sex negative, um, I think it, it makes the point a little bit easier for young people to, to understand, and, and probably older folks too. That's yeah. just not our population. <laughs> so absolutely with the media literacy, and, and we try to bring that in because it ultimately comes up. Yeah. Um, and um, the uh, there's a column that, uh, that Kim and I have written over the years called Doing It Well. And um, one of the things that we talk a lot about, uh, we haven't recently, but we have talked a lot about pornography and how pornography relates to healthy sexuality or sex negative images. And um, and I think that one of the um, one of the columns we wrote uh, was how porn has ruined anal sex and talking just about like the the really sex negative messages that are inherent in the depictions of uh, anal sex that are in mainstream pornography. And and how how is that counter to what we know about sexual health, about anatomy, about um, uh, people's uh, physical responses? And so I think that um, that there are some ways that we can um, have put those uh, these uh, images that people maybe already um, looking at or reading. So romance novels is another great example that's pretty accessible. And then saying, um, how is that a healthy relationship? How is that an unhealthy relationship? And really helping people get at that. Um, the challenges that about combining these two approaches together, um, I think part of I think the overarching challenge is how do we how do we make this happen? How do we how do we combine these two things, which sometimes feel like oil and water? Um, that sexuality is supposed to be fun, funny, light, scintillating, and rape is serious and tra traumatic and um, drudgery and something we have to talk about. And um, and I think that um, for um, I don't know if we've experienced this um, or we don't at this point, but over time I think that whenever you're bringing people together to collaborate and they're from different lenses that um, each person's sexual health or whether you're talking sexual health or sexual violence prevention may feel like there's a real issue out there that's being distracted from and so um, so that that can be um, difficult the other piece is that um, uh, oftentimes our audiences don't want to talk about both. That when we get talking about good sex, they want to stay talking about good sex. They don't want to start talking about a healthy, or they don't want to start talking about rape and sexual violence. So that's a real downer. And so we have to continuously work together to, to make that happen. The other piece of the, I think is a challenge, um, and uh, and um, we we've heard a lot more um, that the book that I mentioned, Yes Means Yes, talks a lot about it. Is that um, we sometimes get misled by thinking rape is just violence and not sex, but um, that our, we live in a culture where um, what's promoted as good sex is power over. Again, we're talking about all these different media images, um, and I like to compare romance novels and um, pornography or, or movies because you see some really interesting dynamics in both, one which is marketed largely to women and the other which is marketed largely to, to men. Um, and so as we, we think about this, that um, 
that what gets framed as sexy or good sex. Um, and so if we're saying that, that so in, in, for us, rape is about sex in so much as what society defines as sex is violence, is power over, is, um, is, un, is unhealthy. And so part of what our challenge is, is how do we, um, as Cordelia Anderson says, how do we counter the normalization of harm? How do we um, shift that lens and shift that so we can say, this is what dominant society talks about as good sex. Here's what we want good sex to look like, and here's what we're going to push it to. Um, the other piece that I think I think is really important when we're talking, uh, you know, when I've talked to, to male audiences is that, we're telling them this is rape, and they're saying, but those behaviors you're describing, I've never thought of as rape. And I think we have to push them to think about those things as rape, and we also have to recognize that given our society's definition of sex and, and what sex could look like, that it's totally possible that folks are um, both rationalizing their behaviors as as just uh, shady or um, uh sketchy sexual encounters, and, and we know that not only are men who are committing rape doing this, we also know that survivors of sexual violence are not always identifying, are, are, um, have a very low rate of naming their experiences as sexual violence, especially within the first year or so. And so um, part of challenging what good sex looks like is also about challenging sexual violence and, and creating, yeah. Um, I think it, you know another part of the challenge in um, combining sex positive with rape prevention approaches is that within our separate maybe fields mm -hmm. we have misperceptions so uh, about what sexuality education looks like and what violence prevention education uh, or approaches might look like and so some of the misperceptions of sexuality education include that you know sex education is really scandalous and, and racy, that we just push the envelope with things, that anything goes, you know, that, that our tagline is that as long as it's two consenting adults or even the, the appearance or perceived, you know, the perception of two consenting adults, then all sex educators are fine with that. Um, I, I think there's also the, the misperception among sex educators and folks who aren't sex educators that if sex educators are to call out things that are sex negative and violent, that somehow that limits what we can identify as positive sexuality. And I think the things that Ross was just talking about highlights that struggle. And somebody asked about like positive, uh, sex positive examples in the media. It, they're really hard to find. And so I think as sex educators in our field, we struggled for so long to combat censorship, to combat good, you know, to make sure that good information and accurate sex education is out there. And so I think part of our reputation is that we want all of this information available, including um, all sexualities and all genders and all of that stuff. And so it becomes this we can't, we can't critique or call out anything negative when it comes to sexuality, mm -hmm. including uh, pornography. I think there's also the the misperception, again, both for sex educators and, and other folks that it's all or nothing. So that if I um, agree with my local sex shop being here and being open and providing some really great things for our community, mm -hmm. that it must also mean that I, I agree with all of the materials and content mm -hmm at that sex shop. So I think we, as sex educators, we need to move to a place where we can say, there's some really great sex positive stuff that's there, but there's also some real sex negative things that are in our local sex shop, including yeah. things that promote um, incest yeah. and promote violence, including pornography titles that call women really bad names, women who are sexual really, really bad names mm -hmm. in their film, um, which is sort of a reflection of the larger society. So. Um, that it doesn't have to be this all or nothing that we can include and really pr continue to promote open and honest uh, sexuality and, and understanding that sexuality is a really natural part of who we are and to bring that into the mainstream more often while also saying, but hey, this stuff isn't cool. This stuff is really sex negative and we want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then um, for folks who work in rape crisis centers, you, you recognize these. There's this um, idea about sexual violence prevention that we're anti-sex, that we're anti-men. Um, and for those of us who are men doing this work, um, the perception is often that either we are um, only in it so we can get laid or that we are involved with sexual violence prevention because um, we are we are gay, and that so in either in either sense, our sexuality is is questioned, and that um, we have nothing to do with sexual health. That sexual violence prevention has nothing to do with sexual health or sexuality information. Um, we really feel like we've got to work together with our colleagues um, to build this understanding. Uh, we're going to go a little faster because we're recognizing we're going to leave time for questions. So, um, so some of the one of the things that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, I was thinking about in terms of how we present, which I think is an important piece um, as we think about how do we introduce conversations about sexuality, is that uh, our pedagogy is really about uh, problem posing so that we bring these questions in and allow the group to struggle with them as opposed to um, setting ourselves up in a way where we're lecturing at them. Uh, I'm sure many of you um, do this, and, and it's... Um, you know, got some really interesting, cool roots in feminist pedagogy and um, social justice education. And so um, that's part of what we do as facilitators. And then we come in and we, we work to balance these fun discussions about good sex with the dialogue about rape. And so how do we bring those up together and help people hold them together? Um, and uh, also the, the challenge then is how do we um, – bring in this cultural framework while we're also providing factual information. Um, and, and that's obviously something we don't lead with. We don't start with talking about the rape culture, but we bring them there later after we've had a chance to really um, let them look at the layout, let them talk about some overarching ideas about good sex and how we talk about good sex, where that came from, and then introduce the idea that there's a, a cultural framework embedded in this. Um, I think some of the other barriers that we've experienced in terms of our collaboration, um, and we, we just listed some examples that, that we had gone through. Um, so ASEC is the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, through which I'm certified uh, as an educator and counselor. Um, and when I was at an anti-pornography conference and talked about the work of ASEC or bringing them on as collaborators, you know, I was laughed at and, and people really put down ASEC because of the pornography that they show at their conferences. And certainly um, some of the primary ways that I learned about um, and saw images of, for example, persons with disabilities or paraplegics having sex and how uh, personal assistants were used um, to facilitate that in a really healthy and good way or um, learning, actually learning about and seeing images about what fisting looks like and how to do that safely and properly was at an ASEC conference uh, through, through watching films. And so um, there was sort of a lack of recognition, I think, of some of the sex positives um, images or messages through more erotic or pornographic materials, but then also um, when challenging members of ASEC around some of the sex negative messages in pornography, um, the way that women are treated or even the names that women are called in pornography, women who are sexual and what that means, and it, and it not being a sex positive approach, you know, then ASEC sort of put down feminists against pornography in their work. and so. I think we've, we've just come to learn that our lenses are different, um, and it's challenging sometimes to bring those two things together, but it can be really rewarding. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I guess we need to just challenge the, the ingrained kind of rape culture in which we live in ways that aren't sex shaming. And so mm -hmm. to really get beyond that, and I think that's one of the things that using a sex educator along with a violence prevention educator really helps for the audience. I think it reduces mm -hmm. defensiveness that, um, and it's unfortunate and it shouldn't have to be that way, but that's the reality of the work that we do. Um, and this is part of what Kim's talking about. Our successes, um, what we really found is that uh, audiences have been really eager to talk about that. Um, again, primarily we work with a college age audience, but we've also worked with high school age groups that are really eager to learn about both sexual violence and good sexuality. Um, and that these are conversations that people aren't having in these particular ways. 
um, that, like we talked about, um, the ways that we could critique pornography and um, and allow that as an entree into not only sexual violence prevention but also what healthy good sexuality could look like. Um, and this. Um, this really helps to model and to create a definition of good sex that makes it very clear that sexual violence is not part of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece that, that I think we talk a lot about is um, um, is that um, uh, that um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. So <laughs> we'll, we'll move on until you so I remember. regain that thought. Um, so, so incorporating a sex positive approach in a classroom while remaining age and context appropriate is a, is a real is a skill. Um, one of the there's a couple handouts that we're going to send you all after this presentation. One is the um, life behaviors of a, a sexually healthy adult. And um, that's a handout that for me personally was really helpful to look at um, what are some of the developmental milestones of folks around sexuality and how do we think about that as we're working with elementary school aged kids? How do we think about that with middle schoolers, with college aged students, with, um, uh, with uh, folks um, well into adulthood and community organizations that, um, that are also still developing, still in, in a sexual de sexuality development. Um, and so one of the things that we, um, that we think um, that we've seen that's interesting is a lot of sex education um, will talk about res refusal skills but won't talk about respect skills. So they'll talk about how to say no because saying no is the big challenge within sex ed um, that they want to make sure that some um, abstinence-based or abstinence-only curricula only want to tell people how not to have sex, not what sex is or how to have safe sex. And so um, we think that it's also important to introduce respect skills, how to hear a no and how to listen to it, because those are also critical skills and cr critical developmental milestones. And then so sexuality is an important aspect of identity. We know that part of the, the stigma around sex is, is a portion of what causes many survivors of sexual assault, including and especially children of children who have experienced sexual abuse, to be silent. That it's not simply about the trauma and the the um, threats that they may have experienced from the abuser. It's also the the um, the piece that they quickly pick up on that sex is shameful and something they shouldn't be talking about. Go on. Um, so. Um we really learned that we need to develop the ability to talk about both healthy sexuality and, and sexual violence prevention simultaneously, which can be difficult because of the tone where the audience is and then moving them in and out of um, sort of light, maybe the more quote-unquote fun discussions into more serious um, topics and, and so that we're not joking about things like sexual violence and then kind of lifting them out of that um, to get back to a, a more hopeful stance of like, okay, so what do we need to do? What can we do to um, promote healthy sexuality within our community? So it requires cross-training. Um, we have found that, you know, sex educators get sexual violence training probably more frequently um, than the reverse, although sexuality education often lacks a feminist perspective, and so that can be really helpful um, for all of us to get cross-trained, including um, sexuality educators attending 40-hour training, volunteering for their local rape crisis and domestic violence shelters or agencies, um, but then also including sex positive messages and activities within your 40-hour training. I know when I get called into 40 hours as a presenter, it's usually for the STD section um, and not so much about healthy sexuality and what that looks like, although we realize it's 40 hours of intense mm -hmm. training and it's really time limited and there's so much information and there's probably much, much more that could and would be covered if it could be longer. So, again, this is sort of the ideal and things to think about. Um, but this could be part of ongoing training that centers do for their staff and volunteers. Absolutely. Um, I mentioned the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, and, and their conference, Quad S, um, is the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. It's more academic, research-orientated, um, and other conference that folks in the violence prevention field could attend. And, and then um, continuing medical education hours, um, presentations or workshops offered at public health, like HIV updates or test counselor training, 
uh, trainings that are offered through Planned Parenthood. They do training on the Our Whole Lives curriculum that Ross mentioned. Um, they also do a sexual attitude reassessment training. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we've recognized as we've attended different, different workshops and trainings is that we get challenged at trainings for different reasons. So at the anti-pornography training, I was really challenged because it's an abstinence-only approach, which goes against, you know, my beliefs and, and values and training in, in the field of sexuality. At the same time, at the ASACT or Quad S conferences, um, there's information that ch can challenge us as well from a sexual violence perspective, including the use of pornography um, as part of education and things like studies around um, scientific studies that examine in different cultures, let's say, around um, rites of passage, so older men having sexual relations with bo younger, younger men or boys as a rite of passage, and so looking at those things without examining it from maybe a violence perspective or from a power dynamic kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd say also that, um, like, in learning more about sexuality and sexual health, that um, BDSM, um, uh, S&M practices have been really difficult for me to integrate within a sexual uh, a um, sexual violence prevention perspective, and has been really important and health and great for me to be able to think about those things in a more complex way. So we can't we obviously can't do it all. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, Kim always laughs at me whenever I, I say this, but I think that we can't just talk about how do we have healthy sexuality for ourselves and how do we prevent rape for ourselves as individuals. How do we have healthy, good sex for our community? How do we promote good sex for our community? And this is a really a social responsibility. If it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a village to teach a child about good sex. And so this means um, within our spheres working appropriately to to help promote what good sex and sexuality looks like. Um, and, and this also means getting this cross-training. And so um, someone asked, how do we do this when we can't even say the word sex, when we're in a, a doing a workshop? And I know a lot in our community that there are a lot of schools that um, will invite our rape crisis educators in, but they can't say the word sex. Seems a little tricky to do that. But I think that part of what we have to do is to have that lens in the back of our heads so that even if we're strategically knowing what we can and can't say in that room, we're also providing resources that are aware and, and um, promote healthy sexuality, that we're able to talk to, um, to teachers and other, um, other folks who might be um, leaders and gatekeepers within the community to help them get a clue on this stuff. And so we're not the only ones there. We're building some capacity um, for talking about, for integrating healthy sexuality and sexual violence prevention. And I think some of the really valuable things that Ross and I have learned through our collaboration together is learning from each other. And so really, you know, the slide that said we can't do it all, really relying on the expertise of our collaborators. And so there's, there's a different perspective that Ross will bring from his violence prevention background to a workshop that we might give around healthy sexuality. And at the same time, um, there's a different perspective that I'll bring mm -hmm. a around healthy sexuality and what that means. And so it really expands not only the takeaway messages and, and the depth of the program for the participants, but we've also been able to tap into different audiences when we team up yeah. um, than we might have been able to otherwise. So we might go to a fraternity because there is this kind of healthy sex or sexuality spin, and we all know that sex sells really easily and rape mm -hmm. prevention doesn't always. Um, <laughs> At the same time, there's been other programs that um, when we talk about it as being a violence prevention, sometimes it allows us to get into different audiences yeah. than we would have been able to if it was just a sex workshop. Definitely. So um, the, we will be sending you... We'll be sending you an outline for our Wasted Sex Workshop, which, which actually came about as a collaboration between our, our alcohol educator, um, myself as a sexual violence prevention edu educator, and Kim as a sexuality educator, um, and uh, really talked about the, a conversation on the drunk hookup. And so this is where we developed this good sex discussion, and then we talked about what are the role, rewards and challenges for introducing alcohol into sexuality. And so really allowing them to define it and then to explore it and and what we, what we were able to develop was how is alcohol um, really used complexly to um, 
facilitate sex, not just to facilitate coercive sexuality, which I think is, for me as a rape crisis educator, is quickly where I run to, but also for um, people who are, for women who may be using alcohol as a way to mediate their, um, their, uh, um, their sexuality, their, their um, appearance in the community, as well as for men to be able to, um, to feel like, um, well, it's, you know, I, I'm really, I feel really awkward talking about this. This will make it easier to talk about sex. Um, so for all of us to help, help how that works. So we'll be sending that to you because I think it's a good example. Um, we have our resources here. Um, so that includes the blog and column that um, we do weekly, doing it well, that oftentimes in, that uh, incorporates sexual violence prevention and sexual health. Um, the Yes Means Yes blog, um, Moving Upstream newsletter, which um, often talks a lot about sexual violence prevention and healthy sexuality. Brad Perry um, there works, uh, works really hard on that. Um, Our Whole Lives, OWL, which is the curriculum that um, is, for me, the, the, best, um, the best curriculum that, that we've seen um, that's around sex education. And then also uh, of the book Survivor's Guide to Sex by Stacey Haynes, which is a really powerful healing, sexuality healing book um, for, written especially for survivors of childhood sexual abuse, but also Wendy Maltz's work. So we have like one minute. And, um, and Kevin Ross, I'm wondering if folks are able, if you might have a, an additional five minutes to answer a couple questions. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. So, I know that one came on the chat. Yes. Um, was how do you address this work in communities that don't even want to use the word sex? Well, I think that I think that that's kind of what I was saying a little bit is that we have to be strategic. Definitely, how we get our foot in the door um, in terms of what we can say and how we can talk about it. Sex always gets talked about, whether or not we talk about it directly, and so um, or talk about it in positive ways. And so, um, part of our challenge is. When we get ourselves educated, it challenges that we begin to have new tools at our disposal for talking about it. Um, so, um, for instance, we can talk with parents about what um, what are normal behaviors, and and that that can be a way to, to introduce a little bit talking about that sexuality um, and in sexual health development for for kids, um, and that could be part of this lifespan behaviors. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good reason why um, violence prevention folks also need to really be advocating, and, and probably most of you are already, but just to highlight the point that we all really need to be advocating for comprehensive, good, medically accurate sex education yeah. within our schools, yeah. within our communities, within our churches, I mean everywhere, so that we can have those discussions. Because even in our community, there's some, there's some elementary schools that won't allow um, the Rape Crisis Center to go in and do education around good touch, bad touch, and safety issues because, mm -hmm. you know, the word rape or the word sex, which I don't think they actually say in their workshop, but that's the, that's the assumption. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good point around we all need to work together to promote healthy sexuality in both of our fields, in all of our fields, um, because we're working towards the same goal, which is a, a, a society that is sexually healthy and um, the elimination of, of sexual violence. And I think it, it also means um, how do we um, build allies within communities that we're working with um, because folks on the inside can say a whole lot more than we might from the outside, um, and which is part of what I think about when um, Kim was working with some uh, big-time sex educators help, trying to help them see about how some of the pornography they were promoting was, um, was, had a very sex-negative message. And Kim was at a place and in a position um, doing this work that uh, I wouldn't have been. And so it's, it's kind of cool that we can do this from our own vantage point, but we have to build allies along the way. Uh, Great. That, yeah, go ahead. Okay, another question. Um, there's a couple more that came in if you have some time. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you... How are you able to be sex positive with youth in a church that doesn't want them having sex? Um, I think there's ways that you can, you know, you can talk about. So let me back up and say, I before I give any presentation, especially if I know it's for a conservative group or a conservative audience, I will tell them that I will not give misinformation and I will correct misinformation if it's given. So sometimes that 
eliminates the presentations that I do, but but I won't be in a room where, where misinformation is given and not corrected. I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, as you're all probably nodding your heads, that's our duty, um, professional ethical duties to do that. Um, but I'll highlight that I can talk about things like communication. I can talk about things um, about reproduction, how bodies uh, work and develop, what's normal, what's not, um, and to answer questions. And sometimes if there's questions that they just don't want me to answer about ab abortion or masturbation or something like that, I can simply say, like, I, I'm not allowed to answer that question. Sometimes I'll drop a resource if I'm allowed to. Sometimes I won't. Um, but they'll have my contact information, so if they want to contact me later, they can. But I think there's a lot that can be done, and that's not only educating, let's say, the youth or the, the people of that church as the example, but it's also educating um, the church itself or the religious leaders that sex education doesn't, I mean, we, when we think of sex education, we think condoms and sex toys, and there's so much more to sex education than those things, and so it's also about educating people that we can have we can give tons of workshops that don't even mention a condom or birth control because there's so much to learn. There's so much information that that we don't ever get. Yeah, and and um, I think another thing that as Kim mentioned that we can point people to resources. Someone mentioned scarletine. I think another is sex, sex etc., mm -hmm. which are some really good youth-driven resources around sexuality, and and those may be easier to present and to disseminate than for us to actually say it. And um, especially when we're working with youth. Um, they already have access to this stuff. And so pointing them in the direction of the good information can be really helpful. And for young women, it can be really, and, and boys too, it can be really important just to do some like sex positive work around our bodies. So yeah. really highlighting and celebrating female bodies and female sexual function, including things like menstruation and talking about or addressing how um, that often um, gets portrayed as a negative thing, but to really promote that body pride. So that's a really like easy way to begin this kind of sex positive work, even with the youngest of audiences. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a lot of questions, but we only have time for one more. Okay. Um, what do you? Oops, sorry, somebody else asked another question, and I lost the one I was going to ask. Um, what do you recommend, or do you have a suggested curriculum for educating parents? Um, I. I think it depends on what um, <laughs> what uh, age their children are. Um, uh, go ahead. I was gonna say I would you know check with your local Planned Parenthood affiliation because they have some really great resources and pamphlets around yeah. what parents can say to their children that really outlines it in terms of age appropriateness and the different stages of development. Usually, I think. The biggest question that I find from parents is that they're not sure what to say when. How early yeah. should they be talking about things? When do they bring up the discussion? What do they say specifically? And um, from what I have found, Planned Parenthood has you know excellent resources in working with parents and really um, promoting and fostering that parent-child communication. Yeah, um, Owl would be our whole lives would be mm -hmm. another great source. I believe they actually have a parent curriculum that goes along with the the curriculum for different age groups. Um, and then the other would be SICUS. You're going to have to help me spell this, Kim. It's S-I-E-C-U-S. Is, is, is that it? Yeah, it's the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States. Um, and, yeah, SICUS.org. Thank yeah. you, Joy Robinson Lynch. Um, and uh, and SICUS has some really great resources connected to it, including but not limited to um, how to have a comprehensive sex education campaign for your community. They have a great um, resource set of resources for that, but also about how to, how parents can talk to their kids. And I think that the life behaviors of a sexually healthy adult that we're referenced, that the handouts that we're going to send to y'all, that that's actually from a SICUS publication, I believe. We stole it. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Kim and thank Ross for being here today and yeah. for sharing all this wonderful information. Um, and I, I apologize, folks, that we don't have any more time for any other questions. But and this please, has been very valuable for the work that we're all doing. Please email us yes. also. Yes. Great. Um, one last thing before folks get off, that when we do end the webinar, I just wanted to remind everybody that there will be an evaluation form on your computer screen. If you could please take a few minutes to complete this, 
Um, we will have this webinar um, has been recorded, but will be available on the WICSAP website. Um, and I guess that would be it. Thanks again for joining today's webinar.